am happy to introduce Lee McDaniel. She's the owner, creative director, and founder of Black Swan Floral. Her operation is located in upstate New York, um, just outside of the Adirondack Park, almost I think the, the, the furthest north flower farm that we have in New York State. And um, she does a lot of her event designs in the upstate New York and Vermont locations. And she spends a, a lot of time in Lake Placid for different events. And I have to say, she's one of our local flower farms in the area. And I've been following her for years and she does an amazing job with her weddings and her installations. Um, so I'm hoping that you guys have a great time listening to Lee today. So nice to be here. Um, yep, I'm Leah McDaniel. Um, we're way up in Plattsburgh, New York, right on the Canadian border. Um, so we are uh, zone four, uh, just to give you guys an idea of what we can grow here and what we can't. Um, so to jump right into it, I just want to say feel free to, um, I don't know if there was the raise hand button or chat. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go along. I'll try to pay attention. I haven't done a lot of Zoom speaking, so um, if Lindsay or Carla can let me know if there's a question, that'd be super helpful. So I'll jump right into um, my history and how I got to where I am now, and it starts way back when. <laughs> I was a kid, um, my, my parents owned a local organic flower and vegetable farm. And that's really where we grew up. We hung out, we worked um, and everything in between. That was our playground. So, um, you know, growing up with that color and that natural beauty around you certainly was a foundation of where I am today. Um, and also, um, just growing up with a community of artists also kind of led me to this direction. Um, although when I was younger, I never believed I would go into the flower business like my parents. Um, I went to school at SUNY at Potsdam for biology. I thought I would go into some sort of animal science direction. Um, I met my future husband and then we, you know, moved around and searched for jobs that would pay the bills. When we decided to get married, we wanted to get married on the farm. So we moved back and I got a job at a local law firm. And we got married in the gardens. It was beautiful. We had hops on our arbor. Um, you know, guests just loved it. It was, it was really great. And we actually discussed making my parents farm a venue, but the work was just insane. And to host something like that on a weekly basis wasn't really the direction that I wanted to go in. So um, I got pregnant. I was still working at the law firm, but I decided I didn't want to do the daycare thing. So I began searching for options uh, in the area. And my mom was still gardening. Um, she was looking for a change and it just seemed like a good thing for me to do, to jump into the gardens. Um, and we, became interested in the event side of things. Farmer florists at that time were few and far, and we felt like we had something unique to offer. Um, so we really dove in. I began seeking ways to increase my knowledge on the design aspect because I was really drawn to that. Um, as I started to dig deeper, I found there's a whole art world of floral designers. Um, and I was completely, my mind was blown. So um, I decided to search for workshops to go to because I'm a hands-on learner and that was really what I was, what I needed. Um, so the first workshop I attended was with Hitomi Gilliam. She is out of Canada, but she's a world renowned designer. Um, she uses a lot of architectural inspiration. Oops. Um, sorry, um, there's the Tony. Okay, she uses a lot of architectural inspiration in her design and she comes up with some really interesting mechanics as you can just see from these photos. And that was the first workshop I attended 
And it really got my brain thinking in different directions of just the art that you can do with flowers. I was very intrigued. Um, so we started booking quite a few local events. Um, and I'm just the type of person that, that just needs to, to get better and just um, just keep growing. That's just my, my personality. So I attended a second workshop um, with Sue McCleary, also known as Passion Flower Sue. And she blew my mind. She, she really blew my mind. Um, this is where it all clicked for me. <laughs> Um, I finally found what I was looking for in the art world. Um, I found my creative voice. So I had to keep learning and experimenting. And at the same time, we were getting bigger and higher at weddings. So um, my mom was closing in on a retirement and I couldn't garden and be a mom and design weddings and do the business end of everything. So we decided to kind of not let the gardens go, but we certainly um, pulled back on the gardens quite a bit. And I found a great farmer to work with out of Vermont. Um, and then I changed from black sheep gardens, which is what we are originally called, to black swan floral. So in this workshop with Sue McCleary, she taught um, a lot of different design principles that is very important in any art world um, and just as important in the flower world. And I don't think people really realize that there are design principles and color theory and important, um, important guidelines that should be followed to really capture uh, that emotional feel that flowers can give. So I don't know if any of you have heard of the Fibonacci sequence. But it's basically a series of numbers that's found in the structure of all living things. Um, you find it in paintings, you find it in music, you find it in architecture. Um, so basically, you add the two numbers before it to get the sequence. Um, so I gave you a little example here. In the design, or I'm sorry, in the Fibonacci sequence, there's a golden ratio that's three, five, eight. This picture shows it perfectly. Um, you can see the eight series is your heavier focal point here. And then you have the five and the three that balances it. And you can use this anywhere from bouquets, centerpieces to large installations. Um, and this is, you know, this is what Sue taught me and when I really started to learn that there's a, a certain art to it and not just putting pretty flowers together. And of course, color theory, um, you know, some colors just don't feel right or look right together. Um, it, it's really important to kind of get a grasp on that. I think I had a natural grasp just because of my, my background, but, um, but if you get yourself a color wheel and you have that as a reference point, I think that's important as well. So um, let me see where I am on my notes. Stop there for a minute. Does anybody have any questions um, from, from here or should I just keep going? Not seeing any questions quite yet. I'm sure they're building up in their heads. So that's okay. on. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, let me minimize this. As I was saying before, um, I started to focus more on design. I learned that there's an art. And I say that with conviction. There's principles of design that could be followed. And this is where you really get your emotion with the flowers. Also, almost more important than the flower choices are how strong and versatile your mechanics can and should be. Uh, mechanics, I learned after a couple flops um, that mechanics can be easy, but they are so important. So some of your favorite friends should be chicken wire. I use this for almost all my installations, large or small. I use it for centerpieces. Um, 
I use it for flower ceilings. This was all chicken wire. I use it for large scale arbors. Um, I use it for floral chandeliers. It's just a wonder. Um, so basically what I do is I roll out the chicken wire to whatever length you need it for. And then you stuff it with um, anything you have. Um, old greenery from a wedding you know, you had last weekend, or I've used, my parents have horses, I've used loose hay, and I, you, you stuff it with that, and you just roll it like a burrito, and you use zip ties, and then you can manipulate it in any shape or direction that you want. Um, so that's, <laughs> if you're going to do any sort of installation there, that's going to be your best friend. And then you can wire flowers and just clip it on the um, wire and it hangs perfectly. Um, I know a lot of reliable flowers that don't need to be in water and I can share those with you. Um, but the, the flowers that you do want in water, you can always use water tubes for. And then here's a newer product to me that I'm really excited about, um, AgriWool. So there are parts of setting up for a wedding that foam just makes it easier. Um, and I don't know how much you all know about the traditional floral foam, but it's not great for the environment. It's not great for you to breathe in. It's just not anything that's sustainable. So there's this new product called AgriWool that works, I think, better. Um, and it's compost compostable and it's sustainable and it's fine for the environment um, and it's reasonable. So I just wanted to put that slide in there. If you are doing event-based work and you really feel more comfortable with foam, this is a really good option. Okay, someone said I've used Agarwal, but I found it it's difficult to stick stems in. Any tricks? Um, I haven't come across problems with using it. What what type of stems are you referring to that you've had problems with? I know, you know, um, like ranunculus that has um, hollow stems or tulips or things like that. You can always put those types of stems in water tubes first. And then you can stick that into the foam if you're having a hard time with the with certain types of stems. Oh, most stems, really. Um, and you can also um, pre-poke the agrowool to have the, you know, to already have holes in there. Um, I use a lot of woody type products. Uh, I use the, when I use agarole, it's really for aisle decor. So I use a lot of delphinium and larkspur and greenery and roses. And I haven't had problems with that. But I think, yeah, I think a good remedy would be using uh, water picks. And then you can just stick those right in. Okay. So um, I think. If you're going to be providing flowers to florists or wholesale florists or brick and mortar shops, it's important to know the difference. And this will help you kind of decide what types of flowers to grow. So I just wanted to cover that. Um, if you're a farmer, farmer florist, you're most likely providing flowers for wholesalers and our florists. Uh, you might have a CSA flower cl club, Farmers, you might do farmers markets or have a flower stand. Um, you may do event design uh, and or a la carte, which Abby was talking about, or was it Fran? I'm sorry. Um, or small order pickups. The brick and mortar shops, um, they're your storefronts that you're going to see. Um, they offer everyday arrangements, delivery, walk-ins, call-in orders. Um, they probably do some sort of event event design, whether it's just pickup orders or installation. And then you have like myself, a studio florist where I don't have a storefront. I don't have public hours. I work out of my studio. 
um, and I only specialize in event design, teaching, um, experimenting. And then I offer the full scale event installation with, you know, I have my favorite types of blooms that I like to use. So those are the differences I think it's important to know. Um, and it's just kind of get you thinking about who you would like to supply. Um, you know, if you do brick and mortar shops, they're going to need a lot of filler flowers and sunflowers um, and things like that. If you do studio florists like me, we're going to want maybe the more fussy type of specialty blooms, um, a lot of spring flowers, uh, flowering branches, shrubs, uh, perennials, you know, that sort of thing is what we're like really looking for. Definitely some annuals as well. We'll go over that. Um, but I think that's kind of an important thought on who you would like to work with. So these are some of my favorite flowers to source locally. And again, remember we're zone four. So um, I can't source everything I would like to source locally. Um, focal flowers, just to kind of give you a little basic run down on what focal flowers are. They're generally the larger in size flowers um, to make a larger impact. They're most often the focal point of interest or color. Um, and then you have your accents and filler flowers. These, they help connect the focal flowers with the line flowers and they can bridge colors together. Of course, they'll add more interest as well. And then your line flowers um, and your unique blooms. Um, they add heights and more interest. They generally will sit higher in an arrangement and they can give movement when stems are allowed to fall naturally and a sense of balance. So those are kind of how I categorize them. When I'm doing arrangements, I'm going to have, um, you know, something from each of these categories. So peonies, these are a big one. Here, I'm assuming across most of New York State, um, you know, peony season is in June. And if you're doing weddings, you know that peony is a favorite flower, not just in June. So I source these locally when I can, but um, I also source them from the Alaskan Peony Corporation, which really great people to work with. And I can get peonies, fresh, beautiful peonies in July and August. So that's a little secret of mine that I, I do. Um, dahlias, I know they can be a pain in the butt to grow, but they're, I mean, the colors that they come in, you, if you're gonna have a flower farm, I'm, you're almost obligated to have dahlias. <laughs> um, yes, there are favorite types of dahlias. Um, you know, the, the cafe is a favorite, but it doesn't, the vase life is very short. So I prefer the ball type dahlias. Their vase life is hands down so much better. Um, they can last seven to 10 days. So I love the ball dahlias. Poppies are a favorite. Um, I know they can be a bit fussy. Tulips, um, daffs, narcissus. Ranunculus and butterfly ranunculus. Uh, I use lilies not that often. I think that's a, a flower that is hard to use, also can have a strong scent and not everybody loves lilies. Um, my grower grows a beautiful dark one and that's the one that I use in the fall. Bearded iris, anemones, helleborus, melisiandus. A lot of these flowers can kind of be in multiple categories. I put Lysanthus as a focal because the size and the, the beauty that my grower gives me is for sure a focal flower and the colors that it comes in, just beautiful. Um, favorite fillers, flops, the cherry caramel. It works for almost any color palette. I love it. Amaranthus, upright or hanging. We use a lot of the hanging for installs. Zinnias, I prefer the smaller head. Um, but I think that there's, you know, there's a spot for zinnias in, in a lot of different designs. 
Campanula, the favorite mountain mint, explosion grass, wild oat grass. Um, I don't know if you've ever dried wild oat grass, but it dries beautifully. And then you can use it all throughout winter. Chocolate lace, Tweedia is great. The white and the blue, um, blue is hard to come by. Calendula, Sweet Williams, Celosia, um, Coxcomb or the Plume, I love both. Yarrow, any type of allium and pods are always interesting. Line flowers, I think if you have a spot for shrubs or flowering trees, you should for sure invest in those if you're supplying florists. Um, I can't get enough of any flowering branch, smoke bush, um, spirea, all that stuff, we just eat it up. So if you have a spot for that, I'd say go for it. Linaria is the money plant. It's really hard to find. It's a biannual, um, but it looks really great in winter weddings and same with Chinese lanterns, um, great for fall. I can't find those locally. I'm not sure why I grew Linaria a couple years back and I'm still working off of the stuff that I grew. Clematis, sweet peas, um, two favorites. And then of course you have to have your Larkspur, Duffinium, Snapdragons, Foxglove is a favorite. Scabiosa stock, Fritillaria is a favorite. Still the uh, thornless blackberry if you I know foliage uh, or greenery is hard to grow, but this stuff is pretty cool as well as the, the mountain. Mint. So any questions there? Oh, you know, I did have some honorable mentions that I don't have on here. Um, sunflowers, I don't use a lot of sunflowers just because of, um, you know, the, the design that I do doesn't really call for a lot of it. But if you're going to supply to brick and mortar shops or wholesalers, um, I think that's that's important to have straw flowers. I used to want to use straw flowers all the time, um, but they close up when you put them in the cooler or if they get wet. And that's really hard when you're trying to design because the rest of flowers have to be in the cooler. Um, any other ones here? Nigella Cosmos I love. They can be temperamental. Um, Ladies' mantle is fun. Those were some other ones. So I have a question here. Some of those are invasive plants. Linaria is hard to get rid of. Okay. Um, yeah, I've heard that. And I know it used to be, you know, a lot of our grandmothers grew it. And then you stop seeing it. And I wonder if that's why. Um, like I said, I have I don't do a lot of the gardening end anymore. So I've been kind of out of the loop. Um, and some but, of it might depend on your climate too, where you are, Lee, um, they may not be as hardy and there's a lot yeah. less chance of them being invasive. Yeah, so yeah, good to probably check kind of locally. Yeah, yeah, they're so great. They're so great to work with though on the designer end. Like you don't, you don't find anything else like it. So um, I don't know if you have a little corner in a, a back field or something, <laughs> I'd say go for it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm always telling people with mint, you know, you can put it in a container or something, you know, you're very aggressive plants, you uh, yeah, you yeah. to contain uh, them. Chinese lantern too, it took me years to get rid of both of them. <laughs> well, I wish I lived by you, I would have taken some. <laughs> okay, so let's see, move on to the next slide. So reasons why I stick with my farmer, now that I have one and I'm not growing so much, um, you know, when we first started dialing back in the gardens, we were experimenting with different growers. Um, and I do have a wholesaler as well, because like I said, we're zone three and I do do some um, early, early spring and, and late fall and winter wedding. So as a last resort, I have a wholesaler right out of Burlington that we go to, but, when I can, I get everything I, I can from my farmer. And she offers gorgeous, gorgeous flowers. I don't know how she gets what she does in a zone four, but um, I, she plants in succession. And I'm assuming since most of your growers, you know what that is, but um, just in case, um, basic lesson here. With annuals, if you have certain plants that only lasts a few weeks, 
you can plant the first batch, uh, you know, middle of May for us. Um, and then two, three or four weeks later, you plant another batch and then again, maybe a third batch. So she's going to have these flowers all throughout my wedding season for me and she'll have an abundance of them and I can count on it. So that's one reason why I stick with her. She's also super great with getting back to me. Like Abby had mentioned, we're all, we're all busy and we all understand that. But sometimes in my work, um, there's floral emergencies or, um, you know, it's a week before the wedding and the bride calls me and says, oh my gosh, I forgot to add this. And now it's too late for me to place an order with my wholesaler because they need it three or four weeks ahead of time. And, um, you know, I have to quit, quickly get hold of my grower and she gets back to me really fast. Um, another big, big thing for me is she offers delivery. I work during the season seven days a week. Again, I know we all do, um, but I just don't think I would be able to go with her. She's about an hour away if she didn't offer delivery. Um, I need my flowers Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday by the latest, and she'll make sure she gets them to me. She also sends samples. Now that we've been working together for a while, she knows the types of flowers that I like. So she'll send samples of colors or new flowers she's growing. And nine times out of 10, I'm gonna order that the next, the next week. Um, and then I can always count on her to be on time, which is obviously a big deal in the, the flower world um, with doing weddings. Um, her flowers are abundant and well cared for. So one reason why I left a previous farmer was because her flowers were gorgeous, but the vase life was very short on them and I couldn't figure out why. And I think it was just something she was doing when she was cutting the flowers or they weren't hydrating properly. I'm not sure what it was, but um, you know, the flowers again should be cut in the early morning. That's when they're most hydrated. Um, put into a clean bucket of water to make sure the stems don't get plugged up. And then depending on the type of flower, they should be kept in the cooler. Um, until they're delivered or picked up. Um, they should be cut before they're fully open because once they're pollinated, they're just, they're not gonna last long. And that's one reason why I get my flowers early, earlier in the week. I can control how open they're going to be by the wedding day. So um, that's, that was a big thing is making sure the vase life was, was lasting at least a week, understanding that, um, you know, flowers have different base lakes. So um, another page, let's see here. Communication is key. And I know Abby and Fran touch on this. Um, and it's all, you know, we all talk about burnout and it's a big thing. And I think making sure that you're clear on your boundaries making sure you have a system of how you want these orders to come in, um, whether it's texting or phone calls or emails, Instagram messaging. I myself don't prefer Instagram mes messaging. I'll only take emailing because then I can search for the emails. If I forgot, you know, oh yeah, what was this supposed to be? I can search for the email and it's there. Um, Again, set your boundaries, let customer knows, know what your preference is. You might have one or two days a week where you're gonna answer emails or a certain time of day where you're gonna answer emails or texts. Um, maybe having an order form will be easier for you. Um, at the beginning of the season, if you send a packet out um, with projected flowering dates and pictures, of colors that you're going to be offering. That's really important for me to see. And that's going to, um, you know, that's going to cut back on unnecessary emails that you have to answer if you have all this before the season starts. And again, this will help with burnout. Um, and then try to be as prompt as you can with responses. Uh, my grower has a cutoff date and time for when she needs orders in by for that week. So I, I know all that information. My wholesaler needs orders in three to four weeks in advance where my grower doesn't really know what she's gonna have three to four weeks in advance. So 
we just kind of had that understanding with each other, with each other, knowing time frames and when I need answers by and when she needs her orders by. Um, that's all really important. Just need to see here if I left out any. I'm trying not to overlap with what Fran and Abby were speaking about. Um, I think that covers it. Does anyone have any questions? Any questions for Lee? What kind of vehicle do you use? <laughs> I have um, one of the, the big van, uh, what are they called? Um, I just want to, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a Ford van. It, it's one of the delivery vans. And then I usually have to also um, rent a van for most of these installations. Um, we do a lot of larger ones in Lake Placid. So I can't go back and forth. I'm about an hour from Lake Placid. So I can't go back and forth to my studio. So we generally rent like a box truck and then I have my van and then we have a pilot. So we usually go up with three vehicles. Any other questions? Any other questions? I know I kind of like, I didn't want to talk about the flowers too much because I thought that would kind of be talking about what um, Fran was, was going to be discussing. Well, I know that there have been a lot of questions about trends. Are you seeing anything new for the season that uh, you're excited about or a little bit scared of? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think it's different in every part of the world. Um, I'm really excited about this season with a lot of flower forward designs instead of using tons of greenery, which has been a trend in the past. People are going heavy on the flowers, which is really where I like to design. So I'm excited about that. And yeah, in terms of colors, I think um, people seem to be going brighter this year. You're always going to need your pinks and you're always going to need your whites. Um, people like to throw in blues and purples. I try to get more yellows out of people, but it, that's probably, uh, unfortunately, that seems to be the, the least favorite color. Um, but yeah, I think lots of blooms we're going to see, which I'm excited for. Lots of bigger installations and maybe smaller centerpieces going in that direction. So now for your installations, and you may have covered this, um, are you mostly bringing your own arbors, things like that? Do the venues provide them? You know, I know Abby has a lot of great props already at her venue. Um, how do you find that out from a site, what they have and what they're willing to share with you? Yeah, so that's a good question. It's tricky. Every venue is different with what they allow, the time frames. Um, some have arbors, some don't. So I do offer, I think I have three different arbors that I offer that I can bring. Um, no, I have four actually. And it's easier for me because if the venue has their own arbor, they might have rules about what I can and can't stick onto it, or it might be late and getting put up that day, um, or I have to have it taken, you know, my flowers off it by a certain time the next day. So I do have three or four arbors that I offer. Um, I like to do a lot of designs that can be reused as well at the reception space. So um, a lot of ground arrangements, you know, the half circle arbors that you see, I guess it's not really an arbor, um, half circle ceremony sites. Um, most of it, you know, the, the hanging pieces, I do all the mechanics myself, um, but most of it comes from me. A lot of times they will rent, uh, like the place where they get their tables and linens from might have arbors or hookahs that they might rent from. Where, since we're in the Adirondacks, we don't have a lot of bigger rental places around here. So we all have to kind of rely on each other and, and network and work together. Um, and it's actually, it's pretty great because we're all friends 
because we all have to, as Abby was saying, have that strong sense of community and networking to make it successful. It's a, it's a fun place to do weddings, I think. Um, I have a comment here. If you wanted to talk more about what you meant about the numbers in the design slide. Yeah, so I think um, I was learning the Fibonacci sequence from Passion Flower Stew. And like I said, that's kind of a sequence that's been around for a long, long time. So because I'm not an expert on that, I think I would refer you to um, looking that up um, on Google or YouTube. But as far as the ratio of three, five, eight, it means that there's gonna be three different focal points on your design. Um, eight being the heaviest part of the focal point. So you're gonna have, you're gonna have a mass of flowers there, uh, a bigger mass. Let's say you're gonna have, um, you know, 15 flowers in that focal point. Um, and then in the five focal point, you're gonna have a medium mass of flowers. So you're gonna have 10 flowers there. And then on the three focal point, you're gonna have five flowers there. And you just, it balances it out and it gives the eye a way to follow the installation in a comfortable kind of emotional evoking way rather than having lots of spotty designs all over and your eye doesn't know where to go. So that's basically why you use that. Does that make sense? Okay. That's what she and you, wanted to know. Yeah, good. I'm glad I answered that. I'm not great with uh, explaining myself at times. So I'm glad. Anything else? Um, here's my information. Aww. And that's my little family. It seems mm -hmm. like your kids are the right age to play with Lindsay's kids. Just about. Oh, we'll have to connect, Lindsay. <laughs> Definitely, I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, so. <laughs> Both okay. boys. Yeah, yeah, he's, um, my youngest just turned two, so that's perfect. Yeah, perfect. 